As much as Sony's PlayStation and Microsoft's Xbox are heralded for their innovation in video games, when they get things wrong, they get them wrong big time and backpedal their foobars faster than a bad World of Warcraft player. So this episode, we take a look at these reversed rulings, these overturned outcomes, and these retracted resolutions. As I say, but hello you, I'm Guru Larry, and I welcome you to Fact Hunt, a history of Sony and Microsoft backpedaling. When crazy Ken Kutaragi was in charge of PlayStation hardware, being able to play games from previous generations was viewed as an important feature by the madman in charge. For example, the PS2 could play PS1 games, and the launched PS3 could play PS2 and PS1 games, etc. However, after Ken left, Sony started cutting features from his obscenely priced console starting with the ability to play PS2 games on later PS3 models. General PSP emulation was also on the PS3, but hidden behind the developer mode. And when custom firmware hackers discovered it, it turned out Sony had only bothered to get 50% of the game library working before abandoning the project. Both PlayStation 1 and PlayStation 2 emulators are in the PS4 official firmware, but are, again, locked away, just like its ability to read CDs. The PS5 manual states that the console doesn't have the ability to read CDs whatsoever. And judging by the comments of PlayStation CEO Jim Ryan, it's absolutely intentional too. Now, Jim's always managed to draw heat from the gaming public, probably because he has all the charisma of a cinder block but it was at a Gran Turismo event that he really managed to pull in the ire of PlayStation fans. While showing journalists Polyphonic Digital's brand new title, Gran Turismo Sport, Jim pointed at booths running Gran Turismo 1 and 2 on the PlayStation 1 and remarked, why would anyone play this? Needless to say, the gaming media ran with this quote and retro gamers got quite perturbed. Most people in Jim's position would be on damage control the very next day, but not our boy Jimmy. It wouldn't be for a further four years during an interview he eventually rolled his comments back and started using classic PlayStation games as a selling point for the premium tier PlayStation Plus service. A service that managed to lose 2 million subscribers not long after it launched. So well done there Jimbo. Back in November 2002, Microsoft proved that you really could charge new money for old rope with the release of Xbox Live. For the low, low price of just $50 a year, you could have your sexuality constantly questioned by American teenagers as you wait in an Unreal Championship lobby. As much as a bargain as this sounds, rival consoles at the time, like the Sega Dreamcast, Sony PS2 and later the PS3 were all offering their online services for free. So really this was just Microsoft finding more ways to squeeze money from their customers. Anyhow, come January 2021, Microsoft decided that paying the now $60 a year for the privilege of being able to enjoy games like Fortnite that didn't require any online subscription anywhere else was simply too cheap and that the base price of Xbox Live Gold needed to go up. So instead of handing over $60 a year for Xbox Live Gold, Microsoft decided that they now wanted $60 for just six months of membership. And as you can imagine, people were furious. And just nanoseconds after the announcement was made, articles went up on gaming websites attacking Microsoft's frankly ridiculous new pricing scheme. In what is probably a record time for a U-turn on this scale, Microsoft changed their minds and told the world that actually they were no longer going to be raising the price. And as a way of saying sorry, they lifted the Xbox Live Gold requirement for playing free-to-play games online 
like Fortnite. How very generous of them. This whole affair wasn't so much of Microsoft having a bit of a blind spot when it came to PR, it was more Helen Keller levels of reading a room. Think of a world without the rumble feature in video games now, isn't it? More so a time when they wanted to take this feature back out. Now, it's commonly believed, especially if you look at Wikipedia or the Guinness Book of Records declaration, that Nintendo created a feature with a Nintendo 64 rumble pack. However, just one month before Nintendo's revealing, Sony publicised their own controller that would later be named DualShock. This controller would soon become the standard for both PlayStation 1 and PlayStation 2. But when PlayStation 3 came along, all of a sudden the rumble feature had been replaced with motion controls and the pad had been renamed to 6-axis. It uh, wasn't great. Although it could have been a lot worse had Sony went ahead with their hideous boomerang design. You see, behind the scenes, Sony were fighting a legal battle which was preventing them from using Rumble Tech in their controllers. However, the story they gave to the public was completely different. In February 2007, serial loser Phil Harrison, who was head of Sony Worldwide Studios at the time, gave an interview to Game Daily Biz. Phil proclaims that Rumble is a last gen feature, and that motion control is what all the cool kids wanted now. However, just one week later, Sony settled its lawsuit, laid out tens of millions of dollars, and by September, the so-called last-gen feature was back with the announcement of DualShock 3. What this means is that whenever Phil Harrison is involved, expect everything to go wrong. See Xbox One and Stadia for details. In fact, talking about Xbox One, Digital Rights Management, or DRM, is one of the most oppressive features in all of gaming. No matter what way a publisher or manufacturer spins it, it's little more than punishing the honest. And one of its most egregious attempts came in a run-up to the launch of the Xbox One. The May 2013 Xbox One reveal event will go down as a prime example of how not to launch a new console, as Microsoft not only managed to instantly lose interest from gamers by labelling the new system with completely unnecessary cable TV functions and forced connect inputs, but also release borderline draconian levels of digital rights enforcements. The man who breaks everything he touches, and then Vice President of Xbox, Phil Harrison, tried to explain the DRM policies, but then just left everyone confused. By the time E3 rolled around, it seemed that Microsoft had enough of answering questions about it all, and just told everyone that if they didn't like it, just buy an Xbox 360 instead. The gaming public was furious with Microsoft, and then Sony started piling on the pressure by not only making it clear that they were not going to enact any DRM on their upcoming PS4 console, but also actively mock the Xbox in an online video. Facing one of the largest backlashes ever seen in gaming, what followed was one of the biggest backpedals of all time, with Microsoft reversing all of their used game on online connection DRM for the Xbox One. Well, actually, not all of it. You still can't use the damn thing at all unless it connects the internet at least once when you buy it. But at least they got rid of most of the DRM. And then slid it back into the Xbox Series X. Textbook, Microsoft. Textbook. As convenient as digital game stores are, they are prone to being outdated and eventually closed down. Plus, when a digital store shuts, it's not like you can go through their bins and take home any unsold stock. Once they are shut, all the games turn into Peter Molyneux's credibility and just disappear into thin air. 
And it was this sudden non-existence of games that got the gaming public rather upset when in March 2021, Sony announced that the digital stores for the PSP, PS Vita and PS3 were going to be shuttered. While some gamers were disappointed that many titles would no longer be able to be discovered by future generations, others thought that the digital games they had bought were at risk of not being recoverable should they have a hard drive failure. Although previous Play games were never at risk, as outlined in Sony's press release, many news outlets conveniently omitted that piece of information. Because, you know, why let facts get in the way of pushing clickbait? However, the reason that never seemed to get reported was why the servers were being closed. You see, the PS3 needs to access several of Sony's main servers in order to properly display the PSN store, all of which are named after Greek gods, Ares, Apollo, Poseidon, as well as Zeus. And it's the Zeus server that's the issue here. Since the PS3 was fully jailbroken and hackers picked apart exactly how the machine works, it's been a bit of an open secret that the Zeus server holds all game files with next to no protection on it. And by using certain tools, you can basically walk in and download anything you like. And with absolutely zero way to patch this loophole, the only way to remedy this problem is to permanently nuke the entire server. So, not exactly the best predicament you can be in when your customers are demanding you keep the store open so they can keep buying games for older machines, is it? Anyway, with gamers panicking into buying anything they hadn't obtained for their old systems, Sony weighed their options and decided gaining loads of money keeping the servers open was a pretty nice consolidation prize for keeping a back door open for hackers. Gamers rejoiced, Many recommended games lists were made, and Sony were quids in. Everyone was happy, especially the pirates whose digital supermarket sweep could continue uninterrupted. Hello you, thanks ever so much for watching. Be sure to subscribe to be first to see future Fact Hunt episodes. Click on the bell if you already are to make sure you're notified. And be sure to check out my other episodes. And if you want to be super awesome, check out my Patreon. But thanks again for watching, and until next time friends, I'm missing you already.